So thank you all for coming back after the break so enlivened from the presentations and the discussions you had in the, the lunch break. It, it really is a fantastic conference, not just in giving information, but allowing you that opportunity to make those networks and make those connections. So welcome back this afternoon to a fantastic session, session three, Future Building Technologies, Australian Businesses and Global Markets. This is a wonderful opportunity and time for us to start to look and explore at what is the building, Australian building technology scene on the global map and how can businesses make the most of our global markets. What I'll do in this session is I'll start by introducing the fantastic panel and I'll get each of the, um, the team, the Austrade team, then to set the scene for their markets. And then we'll explore what could that mean for Australian businesses. And I'll also ask, what are the practical steps? What can companies actually do when they leave here this afternoon or tomorrow um, in each of these markets? And then more broadly, how to be successful in global markets. So just for those of you who are not particularly familiar with Austrade's role, I thought I'd just start with a couple of quick sentences. So the Australian Trade and Investment Commission, or Austrade, promotes Australian trade, investment, tourism and education to the world. Austrade links Australian businesses to global export opportunities by opening doors, unlocking opportunities, quite simply to help Australian businesses to go further, faster. So it's a real pleasure to be partnering with Austrade on this session this afternoon. I'll start by introducing one of our, our panellists on screen, Sally Dean. Sally is the Acting General Manager ASEAN at Austrade um, and the Senior Trade Commissioner based in Jakarta in Indonesia and beaming in from her office in Indonesia. So thank you for joining us, Sally. Sally and her team promote and facilitate trade and investment, education and tourism ties between Australia and the markets across ASEAN. And as you'll know, ASEAN is quite a defined and very large part of our region. Um, Sally has held roles in human resources, government relations, corporate policy, ministerial and parliamentary services and international liaison. Most recently, Sally led Austrade's government division with responsibility for leading Austrade's engagement across government and with ministers and their offices. She's also served as Austrade's chief human resources officer. She holds a degrees in economics and science, psychology from the ANU. Welcome, Sally. Great to have you on the panel. Thank you. We also have beaming in from India, Tim White, Trade and Investment Commissioner and Councillor General, Austrade. Tim manages Austrade's flagship trade and investment promotion program in industry. And you'll, you'll see the, the wonderful logo. We've just been joshing Tim about um, the great background he has there, but the Australia Industry Business Exchange, AIBX. It's a digital first and partner driven program that builds two way business literacy and drives commercial outcomes in priority sectors, including agri food, mining and resources, infrastructure and education. And time and again, when industry looks at how do we be successful in business in other markets, one of the key things is that literacy in the market. And that's something perhaps we can explore as well. Tim also leads Austrade's marketing and mining and resources teams in South Asia and manages Austrade's New Delhi and Kolkata and Dakar posts. Previously, Tim served as Austrade with Austrade in Greater China, where he led Austrade's healthcare team and managed the ag agency's West Asia presence. He's worked for more than 10 years with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade across China and Canberra, so we can all be thoroughly envious of Tim's career. He holds a degree in law and Asian studies, also from the ANU, clearly a very illustrious alumni there, so thank you. Here with us in Sydney, 
We have Catherine Hill, Senior Investment Advisor Asia with Austrade. Catherine is from Brisbane rather than being in one of the exotic locations at the moment. Um, so Catherine is a Senior Investment Advisor on the Europe desk with 10 years experience in investment attraction and facilitation and a strong track record in tourism infrastructure where she worked to deliver Tourism 2020 goals which resulted in $2.6 billion of investment across 30 projects in regional and capital cities. She's worked with major investors across infrastructure, advanced technologies and financial services, possesses a deep understanding of businesses' priorities and decision-making processes and is passionate about driving Australia's economic growth. Catherine has a Bachelor in International Business and a Master's in International Business. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. And making up uh, the final member of our panel is Isaac Coonan, Industry Lead Building 4.0 uh, <laughs> CRC. Isaac has extensive global experience in building innovative technology clusters, aiming to solve some of the world's largest issues. Over, over the past five years, he's focused on building the Australian Southeast Asian property tech cluster, working for global venture capital firms to lead accelerated programs designed to be the conduit between the emerging technology cluster and industry. Most recently, Isaac has been one of the um, and delivered Australia's only city-led prop tech initiative on behalf of the Brisbane City Council, working as the industry development manager for technology at the Brisbane Economic Development Agency. He holds a number of board roles um, with peak bodies and emerging technology companies, all within the property sector, and is passionate about technology being an enabler for the future of property economy. So this is our illustrious panel. So as we go through today, if you make notes of any questions, I'm hoping we'll have time at the end. But Tim, I'd like to switch across to you here in India. Um, just for a bit of context, India ranks number six as an export destination for Australia with a population of 1.3 billion people. So a very large market. And I recall when Mr Modi first became Prime Minister, he talked about creating 100 smart cities across India. So Tim, perhaps you could give us a bit of a snapshot of India as a start. You know, what are the market dynamics and also what are some of the, the initiatives that, that you're leading there in India? Thank you. Sure, thanks, Bronwyn, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the AIBX um, brand mark behind me because we're trying to ensure that it's seared into the minds of all of our key contacts. So. Uh, Hopefully it's having an impact, but um, great to be with you. Um, so as you say, I'll just quickly, I guess, set the scene on what's happening here in India, both in terms of the bilateral relationship, but some of the market dynamics. Um, and then we can move into a discussion around, you know, the support that we provide and some of the initiatives that we're running. But quickly on the, on the relationships, I think many of you would have seen that really it, it is fair to say that it's never been closer, the Australia-India relationship. You know, there's a number of factors there. I think geoeconomics in, in recent years mean that we're much more strategically aligned than we've ever been. Uh, you can see that with relationships at the leadership level, you know, initiatives like the Quad, for example. Um, on the economic side, uh, certainly, as you say, Bronwyn, it's, um, uh, India's our sixth largest export market, but moving up the rungs um, on, on those rankings. Um, which is great to see. And of course, earlier this year, we agreed an interim free trade agreement with, with India. That's not yet in force yet, um, but it, it, will, it will work its way through the, the two parliaments, hopefully by the end of this year. Uh, and then we're also working towards a full free trade agreement, which will cover, I think, more of the areas that are relevant to this audience around services and technology uh, and investment. Uh, so that's a really positive step. And then there's a range of initiatives that the Australian government's announced in, in the last six months or so to support uh, both uh, business and commercial links, but also uh, our ties on the strategic side of the house, but as, as well as people to people links. So happy to talk to some of those initiatives, but just in terms of um, the market dynamics, I guess there were three factors that I wanted to mention and all of them I think are, 
are really relevant and driving opportunities for the uh, the companies and organisations that we see in the audience with you today. Um, the first of those is is India's really remarkable demographics. Uh, so this uh, country is, as you said, it, it's actually uh, closer to 1.4 billion in the population now. One million Indians turn 18 every month. Um, and and also the, the wealth is growing. So by 2030, the expectation is there'll, there'll be 170 million households in India with disposable income above 35,000 US dollars, which is really significant. And that's representative of a, of a growing middle class. Uh, and, and a sort of corollary of that is that by 2050, we expect that urbanisation in India will be above 50%. So that's really driving demand for building technology for smart cities, for transport infrastructure, uh, and we're seeing increasing success for our companies in those areas on the back of those demographic drivers. And linked to that, and as you mentioned, Bronwyn, PM Modi in particular has a very ambitious nation building program. And that's the second factor I think that's driving opportunity in this market. So uh, $2 trillion in additional infrastructure investment over the next five years is coming into the system here. Um, that means over 6,000 large scale projects in the national infrastructure pipeline. Uh, and a lot of that is around urban infrastructure uh, and again, as I say, we've seen our companies from Australia starting to tap into those opportunities um, across both urban and, and transport infrastructure. The third factor, just very quickly, is, is India's low carbon economy priorities. Um, so this is obviously a big drive in many markets um, today, but um, India certainly has a very ambitious plan. And this is a market where um, the balance between uh, traditional uh, fossil fuels and new um, new energy and renewables is is a is a tricky one um, for the government, frankly. Uh, but they do have a very ambitious plan on on the on in terms of electric mobility and renewables. So that's again is a is a key uh, opportunity driver for us, and that's sort of right across the supply chain from, for example, critical minerals and hydrogen inputs into the economy here right through to uh, smart city technologies that are going to help um, bring down carbon emissions across key centres in India. So to me, those three drivers, demographics, nation building and low carbon economy priorities are really the key factors combined that mean there's a, an enhanced opportunity for building technology and infrastructure companies here in this market. So. Um, that's a quick snapshot. Now, Bronwyn, I'm happy to speak to um, some of the initiatives that we're running, but um, perhaps that's enough to start with and get the conversation going. But over to you. Yeah, th thank you. I, I think that's a really good way of thinking about India in, in terms of those three important factors and people keep that in mind and, and as we go further on. So thank you for just opening up the conversation and, and setting the scene in India clearly a, um, a vibrant uh, economy and market, so uh, very, very interesting. So Sally, I'd, I'd like to now uh, cross to you, and you know, as GM in ASEAN, you, you, it's a really interesting and important set of countries that you cover, and we've already seen Foreign Minister Penny Wong focus on the countries in this region, and that mm. seems to have been one of the things that she's done well. You know, we see Singapore population 5.7 million, but number seven, as our export destination and a leader in many sectors, including in, in the sort of planning regulation area. And in Indonesia, 272 million people, number 13, um, really ambitious to create sustainable cities. So you know, with your location in Jakarta, can you give us a view of the political and economic changes that are happening and maybe then how that links to some of those big opportunities? Yes, indeed. Thanks very much, Bronwyn. Um, and just one small correction. Um, uh, yes, I was uh, the uh, Acting General Manager for ASEAN for quite some time, but uh, I'm now um, just, I've, I've, I've relinquished that role to Mukun Narayana Murti. So he is our gen the Australian General Manager for ASEAN. He's also based here um, and I'm um, covering uh, Indonesia. So um, just a small 
uh, a small correction there, but uh, I, I do have responsibility for ASEAN's infrastructure uh, regional team. So I might just focus particularly on Indonesia um, and uh, uh, I could almost hit repeat uh, on the uh, some of the drivers uh, that uh, Tim was mentioning because they're very, very familiar for Indonesia as well. But just to give you a, a bit of an overview of uh, the bilateral uh, relationship, obviously Indonesia is Australia's nearest neighbour and it's a, a, a massive market, uh, 272 million people, uh, forecast to be the world's largest, um, fourth largest uh, economy that economy by 2050 um, and comprises uh, around a third of ASEAN's GDP. So Australia, uh, Indonesia is Australia's 14th largest trading partner and uh, many uh, would have heard the narrative where um, uh, there is a view that our economic relationship with uh, Indonesia uh, is um, is underdone, is it's often referred to. And um, many of you would have um, noticed that uh, uh, our new Prime Minister Albanese chose to do his first bilateral uh, visit to Indonesia within 15 days of being elected. And uh, he was accompanied when he came here with uh, three ministers, including Penny Wong, the Trade Minister and the, uh, the Science Minister, as well as a, a very senior uh, delegation of CEOs from Australian industry. And that really signalled, I think, um, sent a signal uh, from the Australian government about how important the economic relationship uh, with, is with Indonesia. Um, our relationship with Indonesia is underpinned by a comprehensive strategic partnership, um, which was signed in 2018, but probably of more, um, more relevance is that um, the landmark Indonesia-Australia uh, Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership Agreement, or IA-CEPA, as it's more commonly referred to, which ended into force on the 5th of July, which obviously was in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, we've, as, as an embassy and uh, Austrade, we've been doing a lot of work, uh, particularly over the last 12 months to raise awareness um, of the of the agreement, um, but also a document that was uh, uh, launched by the government last year in September, which was a blueprint for Australia's trade and investment relationship with Indonesia. And the a purpose of that document um, and that blueprint was really uh, to try and derive maximum benefit from uh, IACPA, the, the agreement, and to really encourage Australian business um, who um, haven't thought about Indonesia or perhaps have thought about Indonesia in the past and uh, put it uh, to the side uh, to really take a fresh look at Indonesia. But in terms of uh, Indonesia's uh, economy, it's actually recovered very well during the pandemic um, and uh, recorded quite strong growth in the second quarter of this year, about 5.4% economic growth. And it's actually one of the um, strongest results globally. I was actually at a breakfast um, about two couple of weeks ago where a representative from the IMF referred to Indonesia as a bright spot uh, across the, um, uh, the uh, world in terms of uh, its economic uh, performance. Um, President Jokowi um, is in a strong political position. Um, he, he is in the, uh, the second half of his second term uh, and must step down in, uh, uh, at the end of his current term. And there are uh, elections um, scheduled for February uh, 2024. Uh, and as a result, he uh, is very ambitious and pushing very hard on some of his uh, core strategic priorities, one of which includes um, the development of a new capital uh, so to his, uh, one of his signature um, priorities is to um, develop a new capital for Indonesia called Nusantara and it um, will be based in Kali, uh, Kalimantan uh, and uh, he's pushing very, very hard for um, you know, uh, uh, the construction of Nusantara to, to um, uh, progress over the next between now and uh, 2024, in particular to um, develop the core um, the centre of the of the new capital city. The other things that he has been, um, uh, because of his strong political position, he's been able to um, progress some really significant economic reforms over um, over the last um, over the last couple of years. One of one of which is the passage of what's referred to here as the omni, omnibus law on job creation, um, and that in basically. Um, uh, brought, uh, simplified and brought together a large number of um, 
um, regulation and laws across uh, Indonesia into a single into a single single omnibus law, as it's called. But what it, what um, what it also supported was um, the development of the creation of Indonesia's sovereign wealth fund, the Indonesia Investment Authority, and that um, the INA is very much um, about. Uh, looking to invest, uh, uh, sorry, to attract investment into Indonesia to drive um, the significant infrastructure uh, nation building program that um, that uh, President Jokowi uh, is um, is focused on, and I guess of interest was um, one of the outcomes of. of uh, Prime Minister Albanese's uh, visit here was a commitment for, uh, to, for a delegation, uh, Greg Combay to lead a delegation of um, superannuation funds and institutional investors to Indonesia to have conversations with the INA, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, but as well as uh, Indonesian uh, ministers to really talk about, um, you know, to look at what are the opportunities for Australian investment, particularly in, in infrastructure and uh, renewable energy uh, here in Indonesia. So that, uh, that that visit took place last week, so it's only very early days. Um, very quickly, um, in terms of the drivers for Indonesia, very similar to uh, Indonesia, massive population, very young, so um, really benefiting from uh, sort of a demo demographic dividend. They're, they're young, they're rapidly uh, uh, urbanising, they um, are very digitally savvy. This is an incredibly um, digitally savvy market across the board. Um, Again, similar to Indonesia, there is a significant um, significant infrastructure um, uh, push within the uh, within Indonesia, uh, which includes that, uh, in particular, the the new Sentara, the new capital, but also the development of an electric vehicles um, electric vehicles uh, uh, industry right across the supply chain, and that leads into that third uh, similar theme, uh, which is around Indonesia's and the green economy uh, ambition, which is really um, it's challenging for Indonesia, like Australia, but like India, you know, it's a very, has a number of, uh, has a, a coal, it's got a lot of coal assets here. So decarbonising its economy is tricky, um, but it's uh, it's certainly very committed in terms of developing a green economy, decarbonising its existing, uh, existing industries, its mining and uh, energy industries, developing an electric vehicles uh, uh, industry, and also um, really lifting dramatically the contribution of renewable energy to uh, Indonesia's overall energy mix. It's currently around 11%. They're trying to get, they've um, got a goal of trying to push it to 23% by uh, 2025 and sort of, you know, much, uh, much higher in a short space of time. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and um, yeah, happy to, happy to continue to talk about what, what, what opportunities that's driving. Oh, thank you. That's really fascinating to see the sort of parallels between India and Indonesia, um, the, the that nation building ambition of, of the leaders and, and those opportunities. So thank you for setting the scene there. Um, Sally, I'm, I'm now going to switch to you. And I, I think, um, you know, we're, sorry, Catherine, get, get the things right. Um, really like your insights from your time in Europe, you know, countries like the UK and Germany. And the, the UK is our number five export destination. Interestingly, gold is the, the largest single category of, of our export, exports. Um, by almost a couple of orders of magnitude, I was quite impressed with that. Um, and we've got strong historical and cultural ties there. Germany ranks number 14 as an export de destination. And no surprises that the largest import into Australia is wonderful cars. So uh, as an engineer, I always love looking at the automotive um, landscape on our streets. So um, perhaps you could give us a little bit of an insight into Europe. And, and also, what should we know about free trade agreements? Because it's something we hear often and it's like, oh, yeah, that, that, that's great. But what do they mean? So maybe you could look sure. at two aspects there for us. Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, Traditionally, well, over the last probably decade, we've leaned in more on the investment attraction base with Europe and the UK. I mean, the Europe as a block is, I think, our second largest two-way trading partner, our third largest, largest destination for exports. But we've really um, begun to, to skill up those export lines within, within Europe. We have about eight offices 
across Europe that are focused on both the trade and the export um, focus of Austrade now. But it is a challenging, a bit of a challenging environment there because of current the current situation, um, the geopolitical shift, and and the you know the co the situations that have been prompted by COVID and the supply chain issues that they're that they're suffering over there. Um, there is a very long, strong history of, of trade and investment, um, particularly out of UK, and therefore we really f try and laser focus where we're um, going to add value. Uh, with regards to free trade agreements, we're, we're kind of a dab hand at doing those now. Um, Australia is, I think we've done 16 in all. Uh, and this is this is not an area. I mean, we feed into it, but this is an area that is largely managed by our foreign affairs colleagues. But with the uh, UK free trade agreement, it was their first one out of the out of the um, Europe bloc that they have done one on one, um, and it was about our eleventh or twelfth, I think. Uh, but there was a much greater focus on professional services. Uh, and uh, two-way innovation partnerships. Uh, so we're finding that is becoming a, a, a far greater part of the, of the free trade discussions. Uh, and of course in Europe as we, as we reinvigorate discussions there, um, carbon abatement, energy, uh, and um, t our commitments to the Paris Agreement are all front and centre of those discussions with regards to free trade agreement. And what that might mean is that um, businesses that, that feed into achieving those targets get much greater access uh, and far less barriers um, when they're go heading into, into the Europe bloc. So it's just something to be aware of. I mean, traditionally, the free trade agreement has been around agricultural um, tariffs and, and commodity barriers, but now there is, you know, with our more sophisticated trade and investment partners, there's a bit more of a shift towards uh, digital economy, uh, digitalization, and um, and the um, the push towards net zero. What I really find interesting there is if you can almost be seen to be a good corporate and international citizen, then Europe's really interested, you know, things like that. How do you contribute to the carbon abatement and, and be seen to be part of that? And I, I think many of the businesses here are part of that solution. So I think that um, becomes an opportunity. And just chat amongst yourselves for one minute because I left my notes over there. Before I switch to Isaac, I did want to go back and speak and just get each of you to think about what should people practically do to understand the markets? So we've, we've had a little bit of a, a taster here. Um, you know, how do you understand what, what it means to fit with these markets and what are those business protocols? So I might work backwards, Catherine, maybe starting with you, what should people practically do to when they're thinking, yes, I can see an opportunity, but how do I go about it? Um, it depends on what stage of, uh, I suppose, export readiness they are. I mean, we have a number of digital tools available, and there is an enormous amount of information put out by Austrade and our and our partners, our state and territory partners, and other parts of government. I mean, one very um, comprehensive. Uh, area that people can dive into is um, business.gov.au and that really takes you through the, the analyzing your own business uh, a, as well as really deep insight into various markets and it, it, and it really can step you through uh, where you're at and, and where you should be focused on first, you know, or next. Um, we also have um, a, a few programs within Austrade including the Export Market Development Grant, which is a, a reimbursement grant process for any um, expenditure that you have in trying to set up and develop 
overseas markets, uh, and there is also, um, uh, you know, various funding mechanisms uh, available through um, other parts of government, uh, including uh, Department of Industry, who are here today, um, and um, uh, Export Finance Australia, uh, and we have. Um, uh, our landing pads program within Austrade as well, which helps companies kind of access those startup ecosystems around the world, and we've had great success out of those. And perhaps for people who aren't familiar specifically with the landing pads, just we I know I think it's Singapore, Berlin, what uh, are those locations? San Francisco, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, Shanghai. <laughs> Shanghai, thanks. <laughs> so that, that's fantastic. If, if you are interested, you can almost start to develop a bit of a checklist. Go on to biz.gov.au, do, do that analysis. Start to look at are you eligible or are you interested in a grant. And, and come talk to us. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> nice and simple. Um, so, look, I, I think this is the practical things that you can really get out of this session. So, um, make those notes and, and uh, of course, follow up. So then, um, Sally, perhaps again, you could just give us some insights about what can people practically do to, uh, you know, I was quite in awe of all of the things that are happening there in, in Indonesia mm. and, and the ambition of, um, again, a prime minister who's looking at nation building. So, so some tips for the audience, please. Yes, no problems. Um, look, I think, the advice that we give to businesses is, is sort of, um, it's the same, um, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's a different sector, it's really, uh, however you approach the opportunity, you know, you, you need to do your homework. Um, so Catherine's already outlined some of the resources uh, that are available through various, uh, through Austrade and through industry and, uh, and others. And I think they're great. And, and so we always say access the resources that are available. The, the additional ones that I would add to the ones that uh, Catherine has said, um, if you're looking at a market that's got an FTA, then I suggest, you know, looking at the, uh, the FTA portal, so the DFAT uh, FTA portal. Um, and which allows you to really drill down and get some insights around whether um, the FTA, whether it's a bilateral FTA um, uh, like IACPA, which is with the Indonesia bilateral, or even the ASEAN FTA. You know, look at the look at the uh, portal so that you can see whether you you, you uh, your product, your service um, can benefit through uh, through an FTA. There's also um, DFAT does uh, also provide quite a lot of uh, country information as well, which can help um, help you understand, um, you know, the the economic relationship, the political relationship, because that's important. You need to understand the political uh, and economic relationship um, or the dynamics of the market that you're looking at. But I guess um, really uh, a, a market like Indonesia is very uh, much relationship based. Um, so the, the biggest tip I can, uh, and I suspect Tim will say the same, um, anyone that's looking to uh, access or enter in you know, a market like Indonesia where relationships are really, really important, you actually have to invest the time and resources to build those relationships. We often say to people, you know, um, you know, you may have a first meeting with a with a potential business partner. It's it's highly likely that first meeting won't get to talk about business. It will be about very much about building relationships. Um, and you know, I think Australians are very used to sort of getting straight down to uh, tin tax and business. Um, but that's um, so, un and that goes to the culture. So the understanding the business culture. Um, about how uh, business is done in a particular market, and I'm sure Tim will, will have some have some insights to that. So I think uh, under, um, you also need to put time into understanding the regulatory environment. Um, a market like Indonesia uh, does have a complex uh, re regulatory environment, so putting time aside to sort of understand what are the relevant laws, what are the regulations, uh, what are the market practices uh, that are relevant relevant to your product or service. Um, and also uh, do your homework work on what else is, um, who else is in the market, you know, uh, have you got pet competitors uh, in the market. Think about the dynamics of the market for Indonesia, for example, it's quite price sensitive. Uh, quality does matter, but so does, so does cost. So uh, sometimes, uh, you know, decisions around 
uh, you know, businesses make decisions, um, they, tend, they, they can favour uh, cost um, depending on the type of uh, product or service. They might favour, uh, you know, the cost differential as the, the de determinant in making the decision. So think about that. Um, I guess the, um, and, and if you've done all that homework and you still think this is an opportunity that I think my product, my service, my company has the capability uh, to, to really uh, have a red hot crack at that opportunity, uh, my hot tip would be reach out to Austrade. Uh, so part of what we do is, um, you know, we, we can provide I guess we bundle our services into sort of three buckets. You know, one of it is around advice. Um, we can advi provide advice around the market, market selection, market strategy, uh, entry strategy, those sorts of things. Then we can also provide advice with connect, uh, help with connections. So uh, a very common market entry strategy for Indonesia is to enter with the use of a local partner. Um, and so we can um, provide assistance in trying to identify potential partners in the market um, and help to connect you with, uh, with those uh, partners um, and also support you if you decide to actually visit the market and, uh, and you know, do a market visit uh, to meet with partners. And then finally, I guess the other thing that we, uh, we do is we, we help businesses um, if, if they encounter some uh, challenges in the market. So we can help bring in, uh, bring in agencies like you know, the department it's not so much not so relevant for, um, uh, but we can talk to Diza. We can talk to Department of Ag. Not so relevant for this conversation, but DFAT as well. If there are some regulatory hurdles that uh, that we can assist with, so yeah. So I think do the homework, invest uh, time and resources, access the resources that you have available, and uh, and then uh, use the resources of Austrade. Great, thank you. Um, that's brilliant. And um, Tim, we will switch across to you. So what? What can people practically do? Sure. Thanks, Bronwyn. Just, just a couple of quick things because, you know, I completely agree with um, everything that Catherine and Sal Sally have said, and I think a lot of that certainly applies in India too. Just a couple of things. One, um, I think Austrade's, you know, greatest asset is our network of local staff globally. So, um, you know, these are, these are people who have a huge amount of experience and particularly in-depth sectoral expertise across our different markets and you know look at india for example we've got six offices in india uh, about 40 business development managers as we call them um, and these are people who really bring as sally says once you've done your preparation before coming to market they bring a level of sectoral expertise that it's very hard to to get i think with other um, partners that you'd be working with so um, that's one thing and just a couple of uh, initiatives that are specific to India that um, we are rolling out at the moment, I wanted to mention because I think they're relevant for the audience you've got today. One of them, and Catherine mentioned the landing pads program, the innovation landing pads program. We now have a new initiative in India that is similar. Um, it's called the Australia India Innovation Network. Um, it's, it's built on the foundation of the landing pads program but slightly different and I guess taking some of the lessons that we've had from, from the landing pads. Um, but essentially this is going to be a program to support scale-ups and SMEs across our priority sectors with market education, market entry and then introductions to potential partners. So we'll be running um, quite intensive programs, mostly in the form of you know two to three week boot camps, for example, short and sharp programs for companies that are looking at the market and really giving them that intensive support they need to, to enter and, and thrive here. And infrastructure and smart cities will be one of the focus areas under that program. So happy to share more information on that, but that's something that's new and, and it's really exciting for us because the technology play here in India is, is enormous. And I, I will say uh, on the innovation network, it's really based around the opportunities in southern India. So particularly um, the tech hubs of Bangalore and Chennai are really where the action is for a lot of our companies, whether it's in smart cities or in areas like digital health, um, new energy. Uh, it's really built around what's happening in the south. So that's going to be the focus of the innovation network. And um, the other uh, program I wanted to mention just briefly uh, we also have a new project on building future skills partnerships. 
Um, there, there's clearly significant skills gaps in the Indian economy. We hear that from our industry partners here and that they want support from Australian universities, from vet institutions and from Australian corporates to help plug some of the gaps that they've got, particularly in those sort of future facing industries. Um, so we're working really closely with um, India's biggest tech firms uh, on how we can support them with skills development. And I think that's probably, again, it's another one that's relevant to a number of people in your audience there today. Um, and it's, as I say, really to plug into um, relationships with India's biggest corporates, particularly in the technology space, on how we can support skill development. So again, that's another initiative I'm happy to share more information on with anyone who's interested. Thanks. Fabulous. And just before you go, is there any cost involved for Australian businesses who say want to get involved in the boot camps? I was just curious. You know, at the moment, um, Australia's not, uh, well, in most cases, not charging for our services. There are some exceptions for that. But um, but under the, with the innovation network, the, the plan at present is that it will be um, uh, free of charge, the services that we provide. Of course, if companies travel to market and that sort of thing, then they'll have to cover their own travel and accommodation costs. But um, but our services will be free of charge under, under that program. Fantastic. Um, wish I could come along. Sounds great. So, Isaac, I'm, I'm now going to turn to you and if we could get an Australian view as one of the, the lead researchers in some work that we did recently on future building technologies and solutions, what are we seeing in Australia? What, what are the technologies that are being successful? And perhaps you can give us some insights from some case studies. Yeah, absolutely. Firstly, didn't ever think I'd be referred to as a researcher, so that's something new for me. Okay. Thanks for letting me be part of this project. Um, what we've seen from an Australian viewpoint when we look at future building technologies, and it's probably worth stating future building technologies is a subsector of a broader technology cluster globally uh, referred to as property technology. And I've had a number of people ask me today, well, what is property technology? And it is defined as any piece of technology, software or hardware that aids and supports the current property economy. And that is incredibly vague and it's incredibly you know, broad, but it, it was deliberately structured that way because you know, for a, a vast majority of the property industry, it is so far behind the game when it comes to digital adoption uh, and the utilization of technology within our sector. So for the group of people who have been really working to build the Australian Southeast Asian property cluster, we kept it broad specifically. The, the piece of research that we refer to here is a collaborative piece of work done between Austrade and Building 4.0 CRC. And it was really to examine Australia's capabilities within future building technology. And so that's really kind of examining technology companies that aid and support the, the building side of property, whether that is design, development, construction, or utilization and asset management and increased performance. What we're seeing across the board from this research and then different reports that have been published over the past 12 months is the vast majority of technology companies in this sector are focused on waste mitigation. And I think when you automatically hear waste mitigation, you think, great, we're, we're stopping excess materials being dumped from the building site. And whilst that is absolutely a part of waste mitigation, I would say it makes up a fairly small part. Where we're seeing the most amount of, I suppose, waste mitigation is in time, it's in processes, it's in systems. It's not exactly purely centered towards materials. It's really examining the full, the full life cycle of construction, the full life cycle of development and realizing, well, where are the, where are the gaps? What processes need to be improved? What, what systems are completely outdated or redundant or for a lot of cases haven't been touched in the better part of 200 years? And how can we improve that? So that's probably one of the most common underlying aspects of who are the Australian uh, future building technology companies, regardless of if it's in energy or if it's in systems optimization or if it's in data and analytics, they're saving time, they're saving resources, uh, and they're saving, uh, for a lot of them, they're, they're kind of building the systems that can actually save our industry uh, in, in an energy perspective. Um, 
energy consumption. What do I mean by that? I think what I'm trying to say there is, is in terms of like you look at a perfect example. I don't know if you guys have seen Space Platforms today. They're one of the companies that exhibited. Phenomenal, uh, phenomenal company in terms of data and analytics. You look at a case study that they delivered uh, with One William Street or even an asset with Brisbane City Council's building. A simple example of understanding how a building is being used better meant that they could optimize things like lighting, the, the cooling control systems. They could optimize the cleaning. They can optimize how the building has been managed. And the savings within six months for the Brisbane City Council building was close to $100,000, you know, purely just by understanding how we use buildings. So that's just probably a really good case study of what I mean by waste mitigation. Now, the, the companies that were examined as part of this research, they're a real mix of SaaS products, software, and hardware. But when you look at the software and hardware companies, they're the ones that are really focusing on exporting. This is just, uh, this is, and again, this isn't sentiment, this is, this is data um, that's backed both by the Australian property, uh, the Australian Project Industry Map report that was published at the beginning of this year, and then also research here. Um, it, is the, it is the companies that have got a mixture of software and hardware solutions that are really looking at using Australia as, the best way to think about it is a bit of a petri dish. Our market in the property and construction industry in Australia compared to the global region is quite small. You know, and what makes, what makes that so um, interesting for prop tech companies is it's a great, it's a great test bed. Test your product, validate your product, gain that traction with your uh, first initial clients, and then scale internationally. In the APIM report published this year, the number one uh, region for global export was the UK. Uh, followed by US at number three, and then Can uh, US at number two, and then Canada at number three. And why we thought that was interesting is you look at markets such as the US, they are a juggernaut. They are enormous. And if I was a tech company and I was wanting to scale my products to a market where I had the most amount of potential, knee-jerk reaction is the US. But what the what the data and what the research is actually pointing out is a lot of uh, Australian future building technology companies uh, scale to regions that have a common legal system. And that is why scaling to the Commonwealth is actually quite easy. There's research that we did um, collaboratively with Austrade. I think it was something along the lines of 80%, uh, over 80% of the individuals that we profiled um, and reported on said that they weren't actively looking at the US purely because there wasn't enough information around the regulatory system in terms of how do they actually take and scale their product into that region. And I think kind of going back to the conversations we've had with our colleagues at Austrade today, I think that's, that's a real gap in the market. And I think that's what this research has kind of indicated is, you know, we do have phenomenally uh, fast growing regions all around the world, but from understanding the regulatory framework behind it or understanding actually how to tap into that market, the Australian Future Building Technology Cluster, um, or the PropTech Cluster, there is that, there's that lack of understanding. Um, and so I think that's why we're not seeing the pickup in terms of export into these regions just as of yet. And it's definitely still to come. So at a high level, that's kind of an overview of the future building technology uh, cluster, but happy to answer any other questions you may have. Fantastic. So we have some time looking at the clock. We've got about 20 minutes where I can feel questions from the floor. If you've got any for... Tim and Sally, what I said is I'd relay them back because just in case the sound's not good. So opening up the floor, what questions have you got? What's on your mind? I know what's on mine. So while you're thinking about that, I had a question and um, I'll, I'll start. Sally, you mentioned that um, going to the DFAT free trade agreement portal I just, it, it, it's uh, something I've pondered. Does having a free trade agreement somehow, if we just read that, we'll get special privileges be as a result of Australia and somewhere having a free trade agreement, suddenly Australia is privileged over other competitor countries? Does that happen? Uh, 
Well, I mean, obviously, um, there is a, a free trade agreement um, or a bilateral or a regional uh, multilateral agreement delivers uh, benefits um, of direct benefits in terms of uh, market access outcomes. So, you know, for uh, Indonesia, the Indonesia-Australia um, agreement, for example, when it came into force, 99% of Australian goods, um, you know, can now enter Indonesia tariff-free and, the, and um, all ta remaining tariffs for Indonesian imports into Australia were eliminated. So, that, you know, they obviously deliver concrete outcomes in terms of uh, market access, but they also deliver other things. So, um, you know, we talk about it being the, um, you know, that they can deliver a head turning effect. So they do, um, they they generate interest in the market. And I'm sure, um, you know, when um, obviously the, the free trade agreement that Australia is looking to conclude with uh, Indonesia, I'm sure that there'll be that sort of head turning effect happening as well. We have seen it um, with, um, with all of Australia's free trade agreements. But it, it does deliver. Um, I, I'll give you a practical example. The um, the uh, the IACPA um, provided uh, the opportunity for Monash University to open the first foreign-owned campus um, in Indonesia. It's the first time it, it, it enabled that to happen. And what we've seen off the back of that is, you know, quite a lot of interest, um, not just from Australia, from the Australian education sector, but we're actually seeing a lot of interest um, from other. Um, other markets that are looking at the uh, the Monash experience of opening here and and looking at that from the point of view of you know thinking about whether um, you know their their universities and um, and training institutions uh, would look at Indonesia. So they um, they definitely um, they definitely deliver actual outcomes, but they sort of have more intangible outcomes as well. But I think the one thing I would say is just the existence of a um, an FTA is not enough. Um, you know, what that does is help provide the framework um, to, you know, for Australian businesses to, um, you know, access the market, but it's it's only one piece of uh, being successful. And, you know, all of the things that we've talked about today, you know, if, the, if there is a, um, uh, is just as important as, you know, being able to access a, 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 an outcome under an FTA. So you still, it doesn't take away the need to do the homework. It doesn't take away the need to, um, you know, find partners and do due diligence uh, on any partner that you, you decide to progress with doesn't, you know, doesn't negate the need to talk to and access other resources. So they're really important, but they're just one piece in the overall puzzle of actually being, uh, you know, achieving successful export and becoming a uh, sustainable exporter. Great. Thank you. Kim, I don't know whether you want to add to that on what you're seeing um, with, uh, with the um, India one. No, I think um, c completely agree. Thanks, Sally. Um, certainly in a market like India, which is frankly traditionally quite protectionist, um, the the signal to the market of uh, you know of us agreeing a, a, even an interim FTA earlier this year is a really important one, and that's sort of what Sally spoke into around sentiment. Um, so we have been prioritised, Australia, I mean, by India um, as a bilateral FTA partner of choice, um, and it's a busy space. I can tell you that there's lots of partners that are trying to negotiate FTAs with India, and we. Um, have got in in the in the um, the first group, which is fantastic. Um, but really, um, you know, as much as anything, as Sally says, it's about sentiment. And the other thing I'd say, just from my experience in China, is um, is we we hit new records with the China FTA on utilisation, and that is companies, Australian companies, actually understanding how to access the benefits of the FTA. Now, of course, there's some challenges with the China market right now, but I just use as as an example because. In some cases in the past, we haven't had great uptake or utilisation of FTA, so it's really important that um, the, the agreement can just sort of sit there and be on the shelf, but what companies really need is to understand the detail of what it means for them, how they access it, and then you really will get benefit from it, obviously. Fantastic. Well, Bronwyn, well, can I just add one tiny point yes, to Yes, you can, and then I'll, said, yep. Yeah. Um, the other interesting thing is that often um, Australian businesses don't know they're accessing an FTA um, because sometimes it's their import partner that actually is the one that um, accesses the tariff, um, the preferential tariff. So um, yeah, that, it's just interesting around utilisation. Um, so understanding 
um, and understanding how to access and sometimes we find that people aren't even aware that they're using it um, because it, it's actually their partner that's um, that's applying for it. Great, Catherine. Uh, and just to add, in the in the UK Australia Free Trade Agreement, there was so much more emphasis on the data protections and creating a secure online environment, which I think is is relevant to this audience and that sort of the next generation focus of, of elements when we sit down at the negotiating table for FTAs. No, that's, that's really helpful. So questions from the audience. Yes, I can see one in the front row. And Matthew Aitchison, you've got the microphone. I now have the microphone, so you're not required to uh, relay the message. Well, speak uh, up nice and clearly then. Uh, <laughs> he said, with mumbling into his chest. Um, I'm kind of keen, Isaac, to hear a little bit more from your side around barriers. Uh, obviously, you've pointed out towards regulatory frameworks. Uh, you've also mentioned legal systems. Um, also, the issue of standards is something that sort of came up previously. Uh, that was a, an interesting point, Catherine, you just made there around data and privacy and, and that whole aspect of how the health we integrate in with the rest of the world. What other barriers are you seeing in the research, Isaac, and, and indeed to anyone else uh, for Australian businesses who want to get into that market? Um, well, I th one of the most common barriers that we saw in the research actually was a few steps before the conversation around export, and that was really launching the product here in market first. Um, when looking at the research, you know, the average age of founders uh, in the property technology sector around Australia is over the age of 40. Now, the national average for technology founders, and that's holistically, um, the, the average age is 26. So property technology or future building technology founders are a lot older um, than your average technology founder. And an inter another interesting stat was the, the average uh, time spent within the industry that their solution is trying to solve a problem for is something like nine and a half years. So that means you've got people starting these tech businesses who aren't fresh out of university. They've uh, experienced industry veterans who've, you know, and this is almost quoting the research, they've you know, cracked the shit at a pain point within the industry. They've looked for five, 10 years for a solution. They haven't been able to find one. So they go out, they invest it, and they make one themselves. And that's, that's incredibly impressive, in my opinion. And also, I from an investment viewpoint, that's the horse you'd want to back because it's someone who knows the industry intimately well. They're building, a pr uh, they're building a solution that addresses a problem they know intimately well, so it really should succeed. If not, there is still this absolute level of trepidation when it comes to the industry to being the early mover, to being that company that gives technology solutions or digital products the go. Um, and I totally get it, there is a lot of risk when it comes to the adoption of digital and technology-based solutions, particularly if you don't have an organizational framework that allows uh, and supports you know, innovation exercises. So one of the biggest barriers that we saw through this research is it's not finding the good tech talent, it's not finding capital, and money and investment into this sector is just out of control. Um, it's not finding ideas or problems, it's getting them validated through industry. Now once you overcome that barrier, once you overcome that initial hurdle of launching your product into market, getting your first few customers, which on average is taking over 24 months. So once the product is built, ready to be tested and good to go, it's taken an average of over 24 months to get the product utilized by a customer. Now that time frame, most emerging tech companies will sink because you don't have a runway, you can't pay your staff, you can't pay yourself, you reach a point of burnout, you, you can't get out. So that's probably the biggest barrier we're seeing. After that, the bar like I wish I, you know, I wish there was something more insightful I can give you. The barriers are no dissimilar to any other business. You know, finding staff, exporting. You know, the companies that are exporting really well at the moment take Verton. They're an uh, awesome hardware software company to optimize um, uh, uh, cranes in, in Australia, something that hasn't been optimized in a very long time. Their big process is to re- um, their big outcome is to reduce the risk of uh, accidents or even death on a construction site due to 
train to do it in. They spent two and a half years trying to pilot here in Australia. I think they got one pilot uh, with Mervac in that period of time. They focused on exporting, and they are now servicing, I think it's 19 different global regions with their devices, over 40 devices um, exported to 19 different regions, and they still only have one here in Australia. So it's something to say, like, uh, you know, what I'm trying to say there is it's, um, I think the biggest barrier, and it's probably something this room can really take away as industry, is it's one of the biggest barriers for future building technology companies is the initial customer. There's a real opportunity for us as an industry to understand why, create internal systems and processes that allow us to accept these companies, and then, you know, hold that responsibility, because once they get up and running, export is not really an issue that we're seeing in the research or any other report for Australian property technology companies. Really interesting. Um, other questions? Yes. Hello. Um, as a tech startup into future buildings technology, uh, a barrier that we find really, especially when it comes to software applications in the building sector, is a lot of work needs to be done in terms of infrastructure, data collection that already needs to be there for us to be able to do what we do. And in Australia, relatively, that industry is advanced and mostly that infrastructure is there, especially with the big players in the property sector. And the barrier would be a lot of the markets out there aren't really as advanced in terms of the data capture. And that is a technical barrier for implementation. What data or information do we have as to like the advancements of the property sector in different markets? And if that information isn't available, uh, do you have any insights on how we could collect that information to scope out what markets should take priority in terms of our exports? Do you have any insights in that, Isaac? I was actually going to be, if I was even allowed to ask a question, it was probably going to be a question uh, for, for Nintali. You know, we're speaking around, you know, this concept of potentially even a new capital and where, mm. you know, new cities popping up left, right and centre. I was keen to understand if there is a focus on data capture of data authenticity, in, like if we're creating new cities, is there any insights in terms of how we're creating them, particularly in new global markets? So Sally, I don't know if you got that, but the question was, how do we know which market is going to have the level of sophistication or the level of data capture that would allow some of the prop tech companies to be able to enter and, and be part of the um, economy? And, and maybe we will start with you with uh, Musa Toa um, and the new capital being built, maybe some insights from Indonesia. Yeah, thanks, Bronwyn. Um, yeah, it's a good question, and uh, I'm not sure I've got a great answer to it, actually. But um, look, uh, Nusantara, um, the capital uh, is um, uh, is is it's a it, it's evolving, and it, but it's 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 actually quite um, in early stage. So, um, you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of data um, available through uh, Indonesia has established a, a new uh, authority for uh, to um, Indonesia, New Centara Capital, New, New Capital Authority, um, and it is um, obviously coordinating and driving the, um, the the development and the planning for um, for the new capital. At the moment, um, what we're what we're doing is um, it's not not entirely clear to us um, at what stage in this process um, that there will be opportunities for foreign firms. Um, we are staying in close contact with, um, and when I say we, I'm talking about um, myself and members of the uh, of the embassy here are staying in close contact with the new capital authority around their plans for how they roll out the planning and the construction of um, of the capital. I mentioned earlier that um, that you know the focus at the moment is is building the core, and the core is really I guess that will house the uh, the government um, you know the government agencies and uh, at the, the hub. The, the, the hub of government, which will be the first that will start to move uh, to Nusantara. So, um, look, there's data. Uh, there's data available through uh, the uh, through the new capital authority. Um, to be, I have to be honest and say I don't know exactly. You know, I, I'm not across it, um, but it's. Um, it, it, it's something that we're staying very close, closely engaged. And what we did was about a couple of months ago, we actually did a um, business update on um, on Nusantara, and um, we we plan to do that 
um, every six months. Um, we've deliberately uh, not called it, uh, you know, opportunities around Nusantara because at this stage it's not clear to us exactly where the opportunities are going to arise. But uh, we've sort of committed to keeping um, keeping the business community in Australia apprised of the development um, and the progress. So we're planning to do sort of a six monthly deep dive um, on um, on Nusantara. Yeah, thank you. It almost sounds like what would be useful is like a league table of data capability in markets. And if you think of South Korea, you'd sort of put them at the top and, you know, and, and I think that's uh, an, another sort of piece of information. Tim, did you have any insights for specifically for India around that sort of data availability sophistication? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Bronwyn. Just a couple of quick comments and um, sort of goes back to one of the points that Isaac made earlier about the fact that I think when a lot of our companies in this sector look out globally at um, markets and particularly the big technology markets, you know, they're automatically drawn to North America, uh, which is very natural. Um, but one thing I would say with India um, that is probably still misunderstood is that it has a very mature technology ecosystem. Um, and a lot of the biggest tech players from India have major investments in Australia. So there's natural sort of avenues to partnership there. So, you know, um, Google and Microsoft are household names, but Tata Consultancy Services is among the top three uh, IT companies in the world by market capitalization. And there's others like Infosys and Wipro, um, Mahindra. You know, there's many of them. And as I say, they've all got significant links with Australia. So. These are the sorts of players, um, and we'll be looking to address this through this innovation network that I mentioned earlier. Um, these are the sorts of players that uh, do have that capability around um, data collection. We, we know that. Now, I guess one word of caution I'd have is that, you know, working with a company at a scale of TCS or Infosys is not going to be the right fit for every prop tech company from Australia. Um, you know, they are huge, they're enormous. So you have to think about um, the scale and is that a good fit for partnership? But certainly they have a pipeline of, um, of com Australian companies that they've worked with in the past across a few different technology segments, uh, including infrastructure. Um, and they've been quite successful in helping them to come to the Indian market um, and grow here and even use India as a hub for uh, services and tech exports to other markets as well. So. I think just one, that's just one point on India. I think it's slightly misunderstood just how well developed the technology ecosystem is here. And as I say, the innovation network that we're running is really trying to tap into that in a more considered and consistent way for our companies. And I'd just add that um, reporting requirements are becoming more and more stringent, uh, you know, particularly around emissions and energy use. And um, for example, I think it's New York City now require far greater reporting of, of energy and carbon use in building, which is um, a fairly new thing. And I think on that, watching the trends in some of those big markets is sort of um, giving you insights in what's likely to come even locally and, and across the world. So I think if that's an area of interest, just tapping into what's happening in, in some of the other markets. One more question before we close. Yes, you may. Oh, and the mic's coming to you from Sarah. So my question is really a follow-up, I think, to the earlier point around the barriers and um, the 24-month period that Isaac mentioned, because I do think we'd be speaking to a lot of the pain points of many of the companies and stakeholders here in the room uh, from the CRC side. I guess I'm just wondering if that is uh, intrinsic to the building industry. Uh, looking at Goodrun's project before, that was a 10 year lead up to where we are now, to a project that's going to be completed in 2040. I was astounded, Sally, that the finish date of the of the new city was, if I heard you correctly, it was 2024? <laughs> Sorry, let me clarify that. 
um, that, that the initial build of the core is due to be um, completed by 2024 and the first move um, of uh, Indonesian government officials uh, will commence from 2024, but this is a project that goes from 2024 to 2040. Hello, hello. Yep. Yeah, I'm back. Um, so that brings it back more into line with what our expectations are in construction. These are really long timelines. These are really big decisions. These are big material capital investments. And so it comes back to the scale of innovation for me, Isaac, and what you know whether this long term this long cycle time is intrinsic to building and therefore do we need different models of understanding investment and different pathways and different phases of of investment if you like yeah i definitely can come on yeah i definitely think it's intrinsic to the way that the industry works um but as i'm sure everyone here can understand it's uh you know it's very different you know we can take our time to create a building we can take 10 years to to plan and design a precinct but you know an early stage tech startup can't take two years to make a cent of revenue or else they won't exist um so it, it, yeah i don't think there's any sort of uh special treatment that these uh tech companies are receiving but i almost think there should be <laughs> in some sort of way because it kind of goes back to what you're saying i think there needs to be a fundamental shift in the way that the industry views rates tests innovation and innovation principles I it doesn't work the same way in which it does and i know from you know obviously working at building 4.0 um you know even having that conversation with our industry partners sometimes around uh, research research operates differently to the way industry does the technology cluster operates differently to both the research and the industry so we've got three awesome awesome drivers research you know, industry and technology all wanting to come together, all needing to come together if we're actually going to create any sort of sustainable long-term change for our sector. But at the moment, I don't think there's a common language that is robust enough between those three subsectors to allow them to work in an optimal way collaboratively because each group is kind of almost demanding that everyone works on that their time frame. Industry wants everyone to work on their time frame, so tech companies need them to work on theirs and research on there. So I think that's actually a piece that needs to be addressed for this to work long term is it's there needs to be a way in which those three units do actually work together far more collaboratively and we're getting there. I just don't think it's I don't think it's refined enough to where it needs to be for it to be uh, for it to be optimal in my opinion. So thank you a great place to uh, to end I think to go off and have some collaborative discussions over a cuppa. Uh, look, this has been an outstanding conversation. I particularly want to think, thank our Austrade colleagues, Tim, Sally and Catherine and, and Isaac as well. But I really took away from this, there are tools available for us online. Um, there's thinking about what markets do you want to get to, start early, start building those relationships. Soft power is important getting to understand, you know, what, what are the dynamics, cultural, economic and political in the markets you're interested in. So um, thank you very much, um, panel. Thank you to the audience. And if there are questions, we're now taking a 15-minute break. Yes, a 15-minute break. Enjoy your tea. Come back refreshed and we'll, we'll have the next session. And I'll be here for afternoon tea. So if anybody wants yep. to come and chat to me about Austrade and what we can do. Fabulous. Great. Thanks all.